Good morning, everyone. Good fall to everyone. Nice and chilly out the last few mornings. I, I had been opening the windows to church to let the cool air come through and make it so it wouldn't get so hot. And haven't done that the past few days because it would be just too cold. So, but uh, apparently by the end of the week, I'll have to again. So uh, enjoy the cool, brisk day before we get a little bit warm. Today is St. Matthew's Day. And so in our prayer at the end of the church, uh, end of the devotion, we'll, we'll uh, reference St. Matthew, also known as St. Levi. Matthew and Levi are the same people. They have multiple names, just like most of you have multiple names. I, I see not just Cheryl, but Cheryl Brutlaw, because there's a lot of Cheryls, there's a lot of Matthews. Well, which, which Matthew? Matthew, Levi. Oh, okay, all right. It's just they didn't do it with family names. They did it with other names. So you have like so-and-so, also called so-and-so. Peter, also known as Cephas, also known as Simon. Oh, okay, that guy. All right. So, last names make life much more easy. So, but with that all set up, we're going to dive on in. We're going to continue with the first commandment and have great fun in the small catechism. And so let us begin. Page 295. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalm is Psalm 55, verse 12 through 19. <clears throat> For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolent with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together. Within God's house we walked in the throng. Let death steal over them, let them go down to Sheol alive, for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart. But I call to God, and the Lord will save me. Evening and morning and at noon I utter my complaint and moan, and he hears my voice. He redeems my soul in safety from the battle that I wage, for many are arrayed against me. God will give ear and humble them, he who is enthroned from of old, because they do not change and do not fear God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Just as a note, one of the things I love about the Psalms is they're so real. And what I mean by that is there's no pretending. You know that David has been done wrong and betrayed by a friend, and he's hurt, he's angry, he's scared, and this is the reality, and it goes through all those emotions, and it doesn't pull any punches. Um, the Psalms were not written by someone who thought he had to uh, behave well in the presence of Queen Victoria. No, he, David's the king. He can say what he wants. And there's some wonderful, deep honesty there. So, uh, including with some more honesty, we get Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 today, verses 1 through 16. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in the later time, some will depart from the faith, by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing must be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God and prayer. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it pr holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The same is trustworthy and fully deserving of acceptance. 
For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of the elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is the word of the Lord. Um, here, St. Paul in this chapter is really uh, laying down the groundwork for what goes on with a pastor, what the, the job of what we call the public ministry is. And we call it the public ministry because... I, Hey, devote yourself to the public reading of scriptures. My job as the pastor of this congregation is to make sure that all people have an opportunity to hear the word of God and to hear it expounded upon, exhorted, which is spoken on and, uh, and explained, taught. That, that, that's my job. Now, this does not mean that you have no business reading the scriptures or anything like that. No, you, you read it yourself. Or if you're in your family, you, you read it with your family. You teach your family, your children. The, the first words of the small catechism are, as the head of the household should teach his household. But one of the things that, that I think also comes up here that is beautiful, even as it describes the the, the reality of what I get as a pastor, is also the very subtle way that it reminds that all Christians have all the power and authority of Christ Jesus with them. We might not exercise it publicly, like I happen to, but, but we possess it. For example, listen to this. Verses 4 and 5. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. Ponder this. Perhaps, and I hope so, but perhaps recently you have prayed before a meal. You have given thanks to God. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let thy gifts to us be blessed. What did you just do? When, when you prayed, you, O baptized Christian, who are, uh, you who are an heir of eternal life, you who are the brother of Christ the King, the sister of the King of creation, you who are a prince or prince of the universe, for whom God has created all things, that, that meal you eat is holy, set apart by God for you and for your good. For it was made holy by the word of God and prayer. And you get to proclaim the word of God, and you get to be the one who prays. And yes, I suppose when we're all together, generally it defaults to me, because I'm the designated public prayer, I'm the designated public word of God person. But you make things holy by praying, by speaking the word of God. Because the Word of God is what really makes things holy. Uh, I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. That is, he makes us holy by the Word. And you now possess the Word of God. And you use it to make things holy. You're given to holy things, and then you also put them to the use that God has set them for. That's what it means to be holy, to be pulled apart. And this is the... the the wondrous thing of, of your life that we don't often realize. Your holiness is not just an hour a week in, in church, or, or, even, or even, oh, your holiness for the day is not just, oh, we're spending this time together in the Word. Wherever you go, you are God's holy child, and you set up things to the holy task for which God set them. So why we talk about holy matrimony. You interacting with your spouse is a holy thing because God has made it holy. And, and you, you forgive someone. You make them holy again. You pull them out of sin and death and put them into the, the life of forgiveness and love in Christ. 
It's a wonderful thing. I get to do it publicly. Aha! I, I get to bless you publicly, but, but that's something that we all do as Christians in our own everyday life. This is why Paul tells Timothy that go be an example. Because what you do as a pastor for the congregation is the same thing that the members of the congregation will do for their friends and neighbors and families and in their vocation. That you will be instruments of God's love, that you will be people who proclaim the word of God. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. That's the pattern of life. Be an example in speech and conduct and love and faith and purity. That's not talking about, okay, which way do I turn it when I'm celebrating the Lord? You don't, get, you don't need to celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's for when we're all together. But how do I speak of forgiveness? How do I show kindness? That, that type of stuff is all, all about all your life all the time. Because that's who you are in Christ. Because he declared you to be his holy child. And you are his holy instrument sent forth into this world to, to uh, beat down Satan under our feet as we pray for God to do. Under our, our feet. You show love this week, and it's an awesome thing. So, daunting task, is it not? Yes. With might of ours cannot be done, since were our loss affected, but for us fights the valiant one, whom God himself elected. Ask ye who this is? Jesus Christ it is of Sabbath, Lord, and there is none other God. He holds the field forever. And with that being said, let's go talk about the first commandment. Large catechism. Uh, the first commandment, paragraph 13. I'm going to try and read through paragraph 25, so a, a goodly chunk. On page 360 and 361 of the Second edition of the Concordia Lutheran Study Bible Reader's Edition. Second edition. So, unavailable from CPH and other fine retailers now. Coffee by Gillespie. Available online. There, I've done my commercials. I get no promotional value for this, but that's okay. They're good things. I want you to have good things. So, starting at paragraph 13. So you can easily understand what and how much this commandment requires. A person's entire heart and all his confidence must be placed in God alone and in no one else. For to have God, you see, easily, is not to take hold of him with our hands or to put him in a bag like money or to lock him in a chest like silver vessels. Instead, to have him means that the heart takes hold of him and clings to him. To cling to him with the heart is nothing else than to trust in him entirely. For this reason, God wishes to turn us away from everything else that exists outside of him and to draw us to himself, for he is the only eternal good. John 6 and Matthew 19. As though he would say, whatever you have previously sought from the saints or whatever things you have trusted in money or anything else, expect it all from me. Think of me as the one who will help you and pour out upon you richly all good things. See, here you have the meaning of of true honor and worship of God, which pleases God, which he commands under penalty of eternal wrath. The heart knows no other comfort or confidence than in him. It must not allow itself to be torn from him, but for him it must risk and disregard everything upon earth. On the other hand, you can easily see and sense how the world practices only false worship and idolatry. For no people have ever been so corrupt that they did not begin and continue to worship some divine worship, Everyone has set up as his special God whatever he looked to for blessings, help, and comfort. For example, the heathens who put their trust in power and dominion elevated Jupiter as the supreme God. Others who were bent on riches and happiness or pleasures and a life of ease elevated Hercules, Mercury, Venus, or other gods. Pregnant women elevated Diana or Lucina and so on. So everyone made his God that interest to which his heart was inclined. So even in the mind of the heathen, to have a God means to trust and believe. But their error is this. Their trust is false and wrong. For their trust is not placed in the only God, beside whom there is truly no God in heaven or upon earth. Isaiah 44. Therefore the heathen really make their self-invented notions and dreams of God an idol. Ultimately they put their trust in that which is nothing. So it is with all idolatry. 
For it happens not merely by erecting an image and worshiping, but rather it happens in the heart, for the heart stands gaping at something else. It seeks help and consolation from creatures, saints, or devils. It neither cares for God nor looks to him for anything better than to believe that he is willing to help. The heart does not believe that whatever good experience comes from God, James 1. Besides this, there is also a false worship and extreme idolatry, which we have practiced up till now. This is still common in all the world. All churchly orders are founded on it. That is, the monasteries. It concerns the conscience alone which seeks help, consolation, and salvation in its own words. This conscience imagines that it can wrestle heaven away from God and thinks about how many requests it has made, how often it has fasted, celebrated Mass, and so on. Upon such things it depends and boasts, as though unwilling to receive anything from God as a gift. For it wants to earn or merit heaven with abundant works. The conscience acts as though God must serve us and is our debtor, and we are his liege lords. What is this but reducing God to an idol, indeed an apple god, and elevating and regarding ourselves as God? But this point is a little too clever and is not for young pupils. Let the following point be made to the simple. They may well note and remember the meaning of this commandment. We are to trust in God alone and look to him and expect from him nothing but good as from one who gives us body, life, food, drink, nourishment, health, protection, peace, and all necessaries of both temporal and eternal things. He also preserves us from misfortune. And if any evil befalls us, he delivers and rescues us. So does God alone, as been said well enough, from whom we receive all good and by whom we are delivered from all evil. So I think we Germans from ancient times named God more elegantly and appropriately than any other language, from the word good. As though it is though he were an eternal fountain that gushes forth abundantly nothing but what is good, and from that fountain flows forth all that is, and is called good. We'll pause there. Um, if you really ponder the first commandment, and if you you think about what Luther points out here. It's easy to see the idolatry, to see what people trust in, what people put their hopes in. Uh, this played off over the sermon on the weekend, just with putting God and mammon, and putting everything else that you put your trust in there, under that idea of mammon, of wealth, power, of idols. And there's a, a brilliant point there that, that came on up. That, that is brilliant. I, I think this is great to be... Um, to thought of, the, the, one of the ways to think about this. Upon such things, it de- upon works, it depends and boasts, and as though it is unwilling to receive anything from God as gift. If you want to understand your relationship to God, who God is, he is the one who gives gifts, and we receive. That, that's, that's our relationship. That's the way things work. That's why we pray. We're asking God to continue giving us gifts. Keep being who you are, God. God is a giver. Uh, Dr. Norman Nagel, who recently passed away, was a uh, pastor in England and then a uh, chaplain at Valpo and then a professor at the St. Louis Seminary. And in one of his sermons, he said something that I think is profound. God is a giver. We want to turn him into a traitor, but you can never turn him into a traitor. God's not interested in making trades or bargains or deals. We love cutting deals. No, God's simply a giver, and he gives you what is good. And really, all sin and idolatry is us thinking that we could cut better deals than just simply receiving what God gives. So, uh, bear that in mind as you uh, look at things this week. Remember, God will give you good things. That's what he does. And he will use you to give good things to others because that's what he does for them and what he does for you. So, with that being said, let us now confess the creed and then we will uh, go about our prayers and about our days. So, let us confess. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many gifts of body and soul that you have given us. And we ask that you give us your wisdom, your clarity, that you would pour your spirit upon us, that we might rightly see these gifts, that we might rightly rejoice in them, that we might rightly share them with the people that you've placed into our lives. You know the distractions, the temptations that Satan throws at us, the despair that he would raise, the evil that he incurs. We ask your wisdom in seeing through all these things, seeing past them, learning to show love more and more and to give more and more even in the face of them be with us in our coming and going keep us safe in all the tasks that we have set before us be with those who are returning to their jobs to school to all those sorts of things keep them safe in their comings and goings bless our children especially as they learn bless those who work in dangerous vocations keep them safe be with the farmers as they make their preparations for the harvest we give you thanks for the food that you have given that we might be fed. And we bless that you would, we ask that you would bless all those who tend to the process of, of gathering and distributing that food. Be with the doctors and nurses who are tending to the care of the sick. You know the, the impacts of sin and death upon our body. Be with them in their efforts to stymie those impacts. Bless those who are sick and suffering, especially those who are, are dealing with COVID and other dread disease. If it is your will, speedily restore them to health. Give them courage and peace and comfort in the face of their afflictions, knowing that you will deliver them, either now or eternally. Heavenly Father, these things and whatever else you know that we need, we lift up to you, trusting the great love you have for us in your Son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. The prayer of the day, again, uh, referencing St. Matthew for uh, March, uh, September 21st to St. Matthew's Day. O Son of God, our blessed Savior, Jesus Christ, you called Matthew the tax collector to be an apostle and evangelist. Through his faithful and inspired witness, grant that we also may follow you, leaving behind all covetous desires and love of riches, for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day, when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work, and our work this day be well pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. All right, folks, have a good and lovely day. I get to, to set up and do something old but new today. Um, we, we get to have our first preschool chapel of the year, but I'm going to have to do it on Zoom. So that'll be an interesting thing to figure out how I want to do it and all that. And I'll learn this time whether or not the Zoom mirror does the opposite. So if I write on the board, it will be backwards or not. But we'll, we'll see. It'll be fun. Chapel is going to be at 8.30, uh, not 8.30, 9.35, so I have time to get ready. So, But with that being said, I hope you all have a lovely day, 
Uh, take care, be well, be safe, and enjoy the many blessings that you receive from Christ Jesus. Have a good day, everyone.